Hello, and thank you for this opportunity for us to participate in this webinar for the UN Global Compact. My name is Mary Jane Parmentier, and I would like to provide this brief introduction to what we will be presenting. We are the Human Economies Group in the Global Futures Lab at Arizona State University, a cross-disciplinary group of faculty and PhD students that are interested in the vast amount of economic activities and livelihoods around the world that are often unseen by official measurement and policy, often referred to as the informal economy. We recognize, however, that formal and informal is a false binary and that human economic systems and behaviors are much more complex. And that innovation happens in many realms of human economic activity, which all tend to intersect at many levels. So we study how innovation comes from that which is deemed informal and how the formal private sector interacts with the informal. Informal economic activities have been more visible during the current global pandemic, and we argue that this sector is not disappearing anytime soon. When it comes to sustainability and resilience, there's much to be learned from the informal, as well as synergies between formal businesses and informal economic activities. We're excited to share with you some examples as we talk about the current work and research that we are doing around the world. There will be six presentations on projects and research in Mexico, Bolivia, India, Nepal, Kenya, and Central Asia, including two videos from South Asia and Latin America. I now turn it over to my colleague, Gary Grossman. I'm Gary Grossman. Uh, my current research relevant to human economies and sustainability concerns how aspects of development, most specifically sustainable development, uh, is promoted or held back by the extent to which informal and formal social, political, and economic systems cohere in emerging nations. Examining the nations of Central Asia as exemplars, the research looks at a region that has all of the characteristics of new nations. These nations have uh, each been around less than 30 years and defined as less developed by international agencies. Uh, it also has, however, a rich historical legacy from the days of the Silk Road in which the economy of the region and the sharing of ideas intertwined. The Silk Road, therefore, constituted an early case of globalization, contributed distinctive social and economic patterns to these new Central Asian nations that may have the potential of providing us uh, new perspectives on many issues, including their prospects for achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Among my, the questions my research will speak to are matters such as the, con the countries of Central Asia have highly active informal economies that have been estimated to contribute as much as 60% of the reported gross domestic product without being counted by official agencies. How characteristic of, is this of developing nations elsewhere in the world that lack such an historical legacy? Further, how has the rich history of the region of economic exchange in trade, social diversity, and the transmission of ideas impacted the emergence of democratic institutions relative to other places around the globe. Finally, with regard to sustainable development, my recent work with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization brings these elements into focus with an exploration of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and their implementation in Central Asia. Further, the optimism or pessimism of regional specialists about SDG progress uh, are examined, uh, then compared with other regions around the world to better understand the social context of nations of the world and the influence, uh, how they influence the implementation of the SDGs uh, toward their anticipated fulfillment in 2030, as well as other future global policy initiatives. Again, Mary Jane Parmentier, faculty member at Arizona State University and chair of the uh, Master of Science in Global Technology and Development. So in the past year, I've interacted with rural communities in Latin America, specifically Bolivia and Brazil. They've engaged with local businesses, non-governmental organizations, and regional and national government entities to implement off-grid renewable energy systems or devices to address energy poverty and the needs of communities. For example, this picture shows a popular solar oven um, that's being used both in the Amazon and the, uh, the uh, Altiplano high altitude region of um, Bolivia. And it's produced by local business and sometimes funded by non-governmental organizations or community groups. And the oven is designed for single family um, home meal preparation. 
However, the interesting story is that we observed numerous instances of people using the ovens for productive uses, such as drying seeds for jewelry and cacao beans for chocolate paste. Moreover, these products were largely being sold in the informal sector. In other words, the jewelry was being sold to tourists and the chocolate to intermediaries. We have a, a, a global project here at Arizona State University that strives to implement off-grid renewable energy um, that adds social value or productive value to communities. And what is noteworthy is that much of this value is taking place in the so-called informal sector. Uh, there's much room for growth with formal in, and informal partnerships. In this single example of the solar ovens in Bolivia, many in these communities that we visited were asking for larger ovens, for instance, uh, ovens that would accommodate larger sheets of cacao beans for drying so they could increase production. Their innovative use of the technology was creating a need for a new product, an opportunity for a variety of entities to address sustainable development through renewable energy and local productive chains. We also observe, for instance, solar pumps bringing water to llama and alpaca herds during the dry season, the core economic activity for the area, um, also engaging in formal in, informal markets for the, um, the production of, of the meat and the, the, uh, the With these instances replicated globally, the opportunity for renewable energy and sustainable development is vast. Thank you, and I will now hand it over to my colleague, Nina Berman. Yes, thank you, Mary Jane. Um, hello, I'm Nina Berman, Professor of International Letters and Cultures here at ASU. As we've already emphasized, our group aims at capturing the complexity of economic life as part of larger social interactions. As our research shows, dominant economic narratives and metrics tend to leave out essential dimensions of economic life. For example, we find data on GDP and stock market to be inadequate as key measures regarding the health of the economy. These measures neither capture the range of actual economic activities, nor do they tell us something about how the majority of people live. My research assesses the impact of citizen aid. Citizen aid is a form of humanitarian aid that derives from personal relationships and takes place outside of formal channels of humanitarian aid. That is, these activities are not undertaken by INGOs or state or intra-governmental institutions. The effect of citizen aid, however, is tremendous, and that is what my research documents. Specifically, my work focuses on the informal flows and transactions of support that come from Europe to Kenya. In particular, I study the impact of actions undertaken by Europeans in a major tourist destination on the coast of Kenya. So activities occur in three main areas, namely interpersonal relations, healthcare, and education. And here is a map of Kenya and also the reason for why people travel to this destination. So the activities occur in the realm of interpersonal relations. It could be romance, but it could also be friendships, healthcare, and education. Europeans invest in health and education and they support people individually. The extent is massive. The town of Okunda, which is adjacent to the main tourist destinations, has 80,000 inhabitants. There is not one family without a contact in Europe and in the current economic crisis that is a result of the pandemic, people survive through the support that comes from Europe. The monies that come in, however, are not primarily used for food. They allow people to continue their businesses, pay their loans, and generate new economic opportunities. And I'm showing you know, a couple of stores here that are run by people in this informal sector. And, and those are the kind of folks that draw on the support coming in from Europe to continue their businesses during the pandemic. These economic flows are not properly understood in mainstream economic, economics. Economic activity is higher and often more robust than what is assumed in dominant narratives. If the situation was better understood, infrastructure development could pursue more meaningful directions. One of the key points of the human economies approach is in the word of Keith Hart, who has um, coined this term human economies, to abandon the unemployment model. And this is exactly what I refer to. So um, with um, the folks, for example, the three stores that I showed, they are not unemployed. 
um, and the monies that support them are not supporting them so that they have food, but rather an existing economic infrastructure. And so, so rather Keith Hart says we should um, embrace the idea that there was more going on in the grassroots economy than bureaucratic imagination allows for. Thank you so much. And I will um, hand it over now to um, my colleague, Rimjim Agarwal. So thank you, Nina. Um, I'm Rimjim Agarwal from the School of Sustainability. And I'd like to start with this image uh, from India when the lockdown was first announced. What this shows is around 10 million migrants who returned to their villages when the lockdown was first announced. And around half a million laborers left the cities walking or biking hundreds of miles away. They undertook this high risk journey home to their villages because they didn't believe they could trust the city where they worked to provide them the safety and the basic protections they needed to survive. And this is not just the case in India, the vulnerability and invisibility of migrant labor is a worldwide phenomena. In fact, in India, this is largely, although not exclusively a domestic migration issue, but in most other cases, we are talking about cross-border migrants for whom the vulnerabilities are much greater. And then not surprisingly, when the uh, lockdown was lifted and we were trying to revive the economies, the businesses faced the problem of labor scarcity as shown in these newspaper headlines. They tried to woo back the laborers with various kinds of incentives like free air tickets and food. Now let's pause here and think about this a little bit. What kind of response is this? We need to keep in mind that this is not the case where a single business is trying to survive and thinking of how it can outcompete others, but rather this is the case where uh, the whole global economy is impacted. And this is the new normal that we are dealing with now. And um, where we have this golden opportunity to rethink collectively in a creative and more humane way before we rebuild the global economy. This is where I think a global platform like the Global Compact, which has labor rights and protections as a core part of its agenda, can play a leadership role. So how would it do that? Uh, based on my research here, I have three main suggestions. First, we need to begin with the recognition of the huge role that migrant labor and broadly speaking informal economy plays in the success of businesses of all kinds from small business to large corporates. And we need to move away from seeing the informal economy as a relic of underdevelopment that will slowly disappear, but as an integral part of our economy that deserves our utmost respect and attention. Second, this is a time when the governments in uh, several parts of the world are trying to redesign their uh, labor laws. And um, as shown in these slides, uh, in these newspaper headlines, uh, in the case of India, several states have rolled back on hard earned labor protection in the name of reviving the economy. And then there was a strong backlash against this rolling back, which then led to recognition of some sort of rights of migrants and other informal labor. But there is lack of direction and different states are trying to uh, impose different regulations. This is happening in the US as well. And we see this as a golden opportunity, of course, for us academics studying these different labor regulations. This is a great opportunity. But I think this is also a historic time for different stakeholders, businesses, workers, community organizations, and academics to work with the government to rethink our labor laws, because otherwise bringing about change can be very difficult. And my final point is we need to rethink the principles on which we will rebuild. Principles of sustainability, inclusivity, and shared value can be the basis for this rebuilding. And we have a large body of research that has supported the long-term value of moving in this direction. But we've never had the collective drive to do so. So this crisis has given us a lot of pain, but also an opportunity, and let's not waste it. So now I hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Netra Chetri. Thank you.
Thank you, um, Prem Jim. Um, this is a great opportunity to share some of our work. Um, I'm going to, my name is Netra Chetri. I'm going to talk about the challenges and the opportunities in smallholder agriculture settings with the specific uh, examples in the foothills of the Himalayas um, and a, a case of solar powered irrigation system. Uh, let me um, um, try to share some of my presentation here, uh, some of the slides here. Um, and uh, the Himalayas may be a water tower, but they only manifest themselves at the bottom of the hills, far below each axis of settlement. Water surges and scarcity are typically at their peaks in the pre-monsoon uh, months, especially February to May, whereby many springs, primary source of water for domestic and agricultural use, slow to a trickle or disappear. Um, so while small um, electrical um, or diesel power lift irrigation is common in certain part of Nepal, erratic supply of electricity and high cost of fuel poses economic hardship to farmers. Um, so our power lift irrigation is a promising alternative, especially as the cost of solar panels are declining and uh, entrepreneurs are producing solar integrators, pumps with high hydraulic efficiencies and low cost, making it viable even for small farmers globally to have them. It enables the development of low carbon agriculture, imposes improved access to water for farmers, reduce energy cost for irrigation and can have a significant spin-off effects in agriculture sector. Um, solar power is amazing solutions in this case with clear focus on social, environmental and economic well-being for, la large, uh, for the last four years. Faculty and students from Arizona State University's multiple schools Nepal's Institute of Engineering and Central Department of Environmental Sciences, Sunbridge Nepal are private renewable energy farms, Resource Himalayas, Nepal's think tank and local government, as well as the community members are collaboratively working on farmers managed uh, solar irrigation system in a small village in the uh, southern part of Nepal. So our focus on solar irrigation is further justified uh, due to rising agricultural carbon footprint as a result of subsidies for electricity and diesel pumps to lift groundwater for irrigation. For example, 12 districts in the southern plain of Nepal alone has about 6,120 6, uh, diesel pumps and 90% of those are operated, of course, by diesels. With a range of solar radiation between four to six hours, sometimes even more than that, Solar irrigation represents an innovative solution to enhance food security while adapting to changing climate. It potentially offers a cost-effective and sustainable energy solutions to off-grid farmers while making agricultural growth a carbon neutral. So engaging end users and local institutions to work towards common goal is an enduring trait of our approach. We believe that successful outcomes comes from process where end users are given a voice in the planning, implementation and management of the project. As a result, we sought to adapt approaches such as community organization, engagement of various stakeholders, development of financial mechanisms, seeking local development supports and mobilizing farmers and others. Through this process, we have been able to create a new opportunities and sources of capital that we could not imagine had it been done in a traditional ways. So um, the realization that social inclusion is an important um, as physical is as important as physical infrastructure is a very important learning for us. Cross-cutting theme, which is a cross-cutting theme across ASU. The socio-technical learning of this collaborative project was a unique experience for student, faculty, community, and Nepal's growing private sectors in energy. Also, good reminder that technological and social innovations customized to locate a specific need of small farmers, smaller farmers can be a part of the solutions 
lifting them out of poverty, empowering the communities, and ultimately contributing to social well-being, a common thread uh, in uh, even sustainable goals. So in conclusion, um, solar power lift irrigation or solar irrigation is a refreshing shortcut to Nepal's food and energy challenges, or I can say that for almost all developing countries, but it requires investment in science-based solutions with local considerations. So this can be an important way to lift farmers out of poverty, but next generation of innovations, especially with regards to agriculture innovations, must not only improve the existing farming practices, it should be competitive to other forms of um, engagement so that the economy can move upward rather than downward. So in my next um, um, sort of a video, we will introduce uh, the idea of climate smart agriculture through the introduction of solar irrigation. Because of the push towards the UN sustainable goal, particularly number seven, which is ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, that has enabled a new level of recognition for energy's central role in well-being of smallholder farmers. For farmers in southern Nepal, that is where the video is from, which sits in the northern extension of the Indo-Gangetic basins, groundwater is the major source of water. It is not easily accessible, however. Water availability is perceived as the main limiting factors to yield increase and crop choices. This is further compounded given the erratic pattern of rainfalls and expansion of dry seasons, further uh, uh, instigated by changing climate. Those with the financial capital install in small irrigation systems with hoses connected to the small pumps at the deep of the well, but it is not an option to large number of small farmers who lacks disposable incomes. The farmers manage solar irrigation system, that is where we started, some four years ago in Kulini village in southern Nepal, pumps approximately 7,100 cubic feet of water from the ground, 158 foot deep uh, aquifer. It has bolstered the field of social innovation as a whole, creating more resilient socio-ecological technical system. It has the potential to irrigate about 50 acres of land. This is small project, hardly $20,000 uh, has doubled the productivity and incomes of over 40 participating farming households in this little community. With access to water supply, farmers can now grow multiple crops throughout the year, can plan their crop calendar, and can grow off-season vegetable, which is a major source of income, especially informal source of income, actually. Um, so this is a transformative changes for farmers who were entirely at the mercy of the monsoon uh, to operationalize their agricultural systems. So farmers in this particular area contributed about 20% of the material cost and provided the levers and so on. We provided technological support and a little bit of a financial support. Local NGO contributed and that local NGO, which is called Local Initiatives for Biodiversity Research and Development, uh, currently conducting on-farm cropping system research trials at the community. So, our ultimate goal here is to engage with the community for the foreseeable future to study the impact of this small scale interventions on the livelihood of community, as well as um, how it has transformed the entire smallholder agriculture systems in this. So the realization that social inclusion is as important as physical infrastructure is a very important learning for now as of this point. So which is a cross cutting theme of several learning courses at uh, ASU as well. So with that, I'll stop here and I'll pass uh, this to our colleague, uh, Professor Halley Eakin. Take it away, Halley, from here. Thank you, Netra. Um, my name is Halley Eakin. Uh, I am a professor in the School of Sustainability at ASU. And I'm going to speak today just about uh, the particular aspects of my work that relate to this concept of human economies. Um, in particular, my interest in understanding the vulnerability and capacities for adaptation of distinct populations to simultaneous and interacting sources of stress and shocks, and namely the interaction of climate change and, and climate extremes with the day-to-day -day livelihoods that are affected by policy decisions and economic volatility at other scales. 
And I think today we really have a, a, an incredible opportunity uh, to think about adaptation uh, in relation to the sustainable development goals. And this means not only thinking about uh, those critical planetary functions, but also unmet needs and human rights of populations who face uh, some of the more extremes uh, of our environmental changes. And this means foregrounding how our sustainable development goals are interconnected, how sector goals are interconnected, and addressing climate challenge together with and as a part of uh, a path to uh, sustainable development. And in my own work, um, I have been primarily focused in Latin America um, and trying to understand the traps or the trade-offs that many households find themselves in where their day-to-day -day logic of their livelihood strategies and their individual efforts to manage risk are not always recognized or valued in the formal economy. So we can think of, for example, a household uh, composed of recent immigrants to an urban area. They've settled on the slopes uh, of Mexico City's conservation land, for example, highly exposed to flooding, to landslide risk. Uh, their resource uh, livelihood is based on precarious resource use. Uh, or job opportunities that are often uh, not consistently there. They don't have an a, a, a ability to a, accumulate wealth in a way that would allow them to effectively both invest in their future in terms of education, in terms of their health, uh, and also manage risk effectively. They're having to purchase water on top of everything else, build their homes to defend against flood risk. And this ultimately has an effect on their labor availability, their health, they aren't able to move out of these locations and this perpetuates uh, poverty. And so my interest is in this trade-off and what can be done if we understand the logics of these livelihoods um, and the ways the decisions are constrained by decision-making at other scales that are not particularly, are, are not make, uh, recognizing uh, these, these trade-offs at the local level. And so um, I've been trying to make these conundrums visible who, to those who have the capacity to alter uh, the conditions of, of many of these households on the ground, asking how do people receive, perceive risk? How are they able to respond? How do policy decisions, whether that's at the level of the city or at the sector, or at, the, at the country in terms of trade policies, shape people's vulnerabilities and their adaptation opportunities? And how should the responsibilities for adapting to environment, environmental change be allocated? Uh, what is fair and just distribution uh, given these various uh, constraints? And in uh, our work in Mexico City, um, we've been experimenting with a variety of different tools to try to make these different logics of risk and livelihood and those trade-offs visible to different actors. So, Working with water managers, for example, we've been using uh, system modeling and um, a GIS database to try and understand and make visible how decisions, policy decisions about water trade off uh, and create uh, patterns of vulnerability and exposure, um, particularly in areas where households don't have a lot of alternative options. Um, we also are working with uh, local populations, particularly in some of the informal settlements in the southern part of the city, with games, uh, serious games and role-playing activities, uh, not only to make sure that we're capturing well those, those uh, the ways that they're managing their risk, the, the challenges they face, but also experimenting with different ways to communicate those reality to those who are uh, in the have the capacity to change the infrastructure and alter the policy environment in ways that would be more favorable for um, these populations. And you can find out more in the website uh, at the bottom of this uh, presentation. So now I would like to um, just briefly introduce a video that, that we've made um, also pertaining to uh, Mexico City. Um, and here again, the objective of this video is to foreground the voices of some of these residents who face particular challenges in their development context and their livelihood context. Um, and in this video, it takes place in, uh, or it, for, it showcases the voices of uh, traditional farmers who are operating their land in the wetlands in the southern part of Mexico City 
in an area called Xochimilco, where um, they are practicing a traditional farming method that is uh, goes back to the pre-Hispanic times. And in this video, the farmers uh, and others who work around the wetland will talk about the context of rapid urbanization, the challenges of finding and maintaining informal and formal livelihood opportunities uh, while per pursuing traditional agricultural practices. And they comment on this idea of whether they feel trapped or whether they see a potential for transformation in uh, those activities. So thank you, and I'll just uh, end there. Tenemos muchos problemas tanto en la zona urbana como en la zona chinampera. Acá en la zona chinampera pues la falta de agua y la falta de calidad de agua. Nosotros hemos estado desde hace como 30 años batallando por la calidad y por la, la cantidad de agua. Estamos en un punto ya de no retorno, en donde canales, apantles y lagos eh, pues ya están totalmente mantenidos artificialmente y además... Eh, ni siquiera se, se pueden mantener bien. Más que nada Xochimilco es como una víctima de la combinación de un como crecimiento demográfico muy violento y una falta de planeación efectiva urbana ¿no? y de diseño especialmente urbano. A partir del agua se derivan muchos aspectos. ¿no? Otra cosa es la cultura, la manera de pensar del, produ del productor. Están acorralando a Xochimilco a través de la desaparición de su gente o desarraigo de su gente a la, lo que es su actividad primordial para lo que fue creado por lo que existe, que es su parte productiva. Además, se está modificando en varios lugares el uso de, de suelo, se está convirtiendo en casa habitación. Esto forma parte del hecho de que Xochimilco está dentro de la ciudad y se convierte en una alternativa para, para vivienda para muchas personas que vienen a trabajar a la ciudad. Una mala alternativa. El primer tema de Xochimilco es, punto número uno, establecer el nuevo Programa Delegacional de Desarrollo. Porque tenemos un programa obsoleto que, a pesar de que tiene una, eh, pues sí, tiene una delimitación específica con relación al suelo de conservación, lo cierto es que está totalmente desfasado desde el 2005 y que no ha podido adecuarse a la situación real. Si viéramos como un mapa eh, en tiempo, como en un time lapse, ¿no? O sea, podemos ir viendo cómo la mancha urbana va desplazando a, a todo un territorio, una cultura y una población, que en este caso, por ejemplo, antes tenía como toda su lógica a partir de un lago, ¿no? que es una, es una cultura totalmente lacustre. Al desaparecer ese lago, se le, se le desarraiga y se le quitan sus bases culturales, económicas y sociales, porque todo estaba en relación a la naturaleza. Xochimilco es un espacio único en el mundo y sus condiciones de humedad siguen aportando un microclima y siguen aportando una serie de, de servicios ecosistémicos que sin ellos la Ciudad de México va a acelerar su... Eh, iba a decir cataclismo, pero suena muy, muy fuerte. o tener suelos de conservación no habitables o de tener suelo como urbano habitable y no tener como suficientes estructuras que permitan que la gente como medio que coexista con un sistema como un ecológico. Entonces eso genera, yo siento, una trampa porque entras en un paradigma donde la conservación requiere no dejar que entre la gente, pero pues tienes muchísima presión demográfica por la gente y no tienes ningún modelo que permita como dialogar. Esa trampa está como de alguna manera también provocada por nosotros mismos, ¿no? O sea, la sociedad en, en, en abstracto, así como hablando de Xochimilco, de San Gregorio, de México, del mundo, no, no es diferente. 
o sea, todos estamos de alguna manera como reproduciendo a microescala como todos estos valores ideológicos, ¿no? ¿no? No es como que, repito, llegue un gobernante de fuera o llegue un poder de fuera y se quiera como eh, instaurar a pesar nuestro, sino que nosotros lo ayudamos también, ¿no? O, o facilitamos ese tipo de, de lógicas. Cada quien dentro de Xochimilco o fuera, o los que queremos hacer algo para Xochimilco, estamos jalando como para todos lados, ¿no? Como para muchas direcciones eh, y no hay como una visión conjunta. Este choque entre dos modos de habitar un mismo territorio que tienen una lógica diferente. Una vida sostenible que ellos siempre o que nosotros siempre hemos tenido así, aunque el concepto es reciente. Y por la otra está como pues el, la depredación ¿no? como neoliberal capitalista de, no, no importa el, el medio siempre que se llegue a un fin y ese fin es económico y, y puedo pasar sobre lo ambiental y lo social ¿no? la transformación de mi comunidad es difícil realmente o sea si lo vemos en, en procesos de, de realidad es difícil y lo veo imposible ¿por qué? porque cada persona tiene un mundo y cada persona tiene necesidades y cada persona no quiere colaborar, Ajá. no valoran lo que tenemos, desperdician el agua, usan agroquímicos, este, los proyectos que hemos mencionado de toda la vida, gobierno da, o yo le llamo papá gobierno, papá gobierno le da a, a los productores y a veces los productores no lo usan en lo que están solicitando. Y cuando lleva una, llega una inclemencia de tiempo no tienen con qué, le rompen las mallas, el viento, el granizo se echa a perder, echa a perder sus mallas, y no tienen con qué. Entonces es un problema grave, que casi es imposible de combatir. Tiene que haber una transformación interna por parte de la, de la sociedad para volver a, a resguardar lo que nos pertenece, volver a conservar, a preservar, a valorar lo que es nuestro, lo que formamos, lo que nuestros antepasados hicieron, lo que nos heredaron. Pero la transformación tiene que venir desde adentro, no podemos eh, generar cambios desde afuera, ya que es algo que se ha tratado de hacer a lo largo de muchos años. Se ha tratado de generar cambios desde, desde fuera de la sociedad y son cosas que no se han visto retribuidas de, ningún man, de ninguna manera, no, no prevalecen, son esfuerzos que generan algo momentáneamente y terminan desapareciendo porque no hay un arraigo en la sociedad para que esos cambios se crezcan, se maduren, incluso evolucionen. En mi caso he tratado de hacer, de innovar eh, y buscar nuevos productos y lo hemos logrado. He invitado a, a muchos productores, pero no, 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 no quieren colaborar. La transformación de, de todo mi sistema chinampero va a depender de, también de mis vecinos. Esa es comunal. Poner el, el tema Xochimilco en... en, en en la plataforma política, que no, que no lo ha estado en muchos años, creo que desde que se, de, se decretó como eh, Patrimonio de la Humanidad Xochimilco no ha estado eh, a ese nivel en cuestiones de, de, de agenda política y eso también detonaría este, que los proyectos que se están dirigiendo hacia la zona tuvieran un, un impacto un poco más integral, o de hecho tuvieran impacto integral y no de forma aislada como se está teniendo ahorita. El tema de Xochimilco y como construir una mejor situación en Xochimilco eh, definitivamente necesita eh, una parte que sea como de arriba para abajo, o sea, que sí venga desde el gobierno. No puede venir exclusivamente así, tiene que haber una construcción de un consenso este, en las comunidades, eso es este, lo primero, ¿no? Eh, o bueno, lo simultáneo, porque yo sí considero que se necesitan las dos cosas. Yo me siento muy dichoso de formar parte de, como lo he mencionado, la resistencia. No formo parte de del de estar acorralado, ni me siento atrapado, no. Al contrario, me siento muy dichoso de tener la posibilidad de, de dar un, y brindar una oportunidad a, no al mundo, no a muchos, sino a mi hijo, que tenga la oportunidad de elegir. Comunidad significa tener una visión conjunta, a pesar de ser personas que tenemos diferentes orígenes, diferentes tradiciones, diferentes formas de pensar o de actuar, o diferentes trabajos, 
eh, pero si formáramos una comunidad que tiene una visión en, en común y que, una, y que esa visión tendría que ser hacia el bienestar de Xochimilco y de nosotros mismos, este, creo que se podría lograr una transformación. Yo me imagino un Xochimilco donde están siendo intensamente cultivadas las chinampas, donde está otra vez limpia el agua, donde puedes ver niños nadando en los canales, o sea, un poco lo que fue hace no tanto, hace 40 o 50 años, este, aunque pues adentro del contexto de una ciudad del siglo XXI y muy cambiada, pero yo creo que todo eso es perfectamente lograble, realmente no, no veo ninguna parte del reto que, que me parezca infranqueable o imposible. Nepal has a diverse environment with the Himalayan mountains, the Mid-Hills and the Nepal plains, known as the Torai. It also has diverse peoples, cultures and historic communities. Nearly two-thirds of Nepalese depend on agriculture for their livelihood. Many Nepalese go overseas for jobs due to lack of opportunities in Nepal. Lack of irrigation is a major constraint for farmers. To increase returns and take advantage of commercial opportunities, climate change is also causing erratic rainfall, making rainfed agriculture more risky. Nepal is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change in the world and needs effective adaptation strategies. Sunbridge Solar Nepal is an innovative company that has successfully developed over 100 solar systems for rural communities. Sunbridge has recently developed a solar water system in Devchili Nalprasi district in Nepal plains. In Devchili, farmers lack access to enough water for irrigation. Climate change has made the situation worse. Sunbridge Solar Nepal, with support from Arizona State University and the Climate Smart Village program, has developed a model solar system lifting groundwater to irrigate nearly 7 hectares, benefiting more than 100 people. Like when we came in about four months ago, this piece of land was really barren and uh, there was uh, using the, uh, the AC mains. Uh, but then, you know, in this area you have uh, voltage fluctuations happening all the time. So uh, the water, so they were having issues with sort of like uh, getting a stable uh, power to basically operate that water pump. And uh, now, you know, with solar water pump, uh, you know, these guys have no issues as such. And, uh, I think they're getting more than 200,000 liters a day, uh, which is really sort of like, you know, as you can see, like, uh, we're, we're getting about, it's about six hectares of land that's being irrigated at the moment, so it's been running well so far. Mm -hmm. 
the solar system operates a 10 horse power pump lifting 40,000 liters an hour from a depth of 30 meters. The system increases cropping intensity, food production, replaces fossil fuel, and enhances farmer resilience to climate change. जलवायु परिवर्तन ले कर रहे हैं पानी समय में नौ पार नहीं इस पर जी अब खेती लगायो अब पानी ना बचे कुने खेती पर नौ होने अच्छा ही ना हम इलेक्ट्रिक बारे गांव के बेचने का मोटर पर किन्हर ले उन्हें पानी होने हो किन्हर ले उन्हें घंटा को दूसरे रुपए पर लाख से पानी को माँ घंटा को दूसरे को दौड़े पा� खोला नाला या कूलों को सीधा इस्तेमाल नहीं है इसमें हम सब आकर से बहुत हैं मार्फत सोन ब्रिज मार्फत तो इस पर सौरे ऊर्जा बाटा इस वक्ती प्रथम बड़ी पानी आग हो सामने हमने इतने ती खोर तो लाग देना हम रुबाय टाइम में पानी लाऊंगा पाइयो पाले शांति स्वागत हमने तो एक दम ही देर नहीं हम रुबाय लगभग तीस कट्टा सम्मा तरकल लिगर नहीं बनी पूरों सह सब सम्मा मिले रहा ते ते अब ये लिगर तो हमरो उन्नति में बनी पके गौर सब बनी लाहत कि नहीं कि पानी रामरो पाल जाएगा सर हमरो दिखते हैं ठीक सा नहीं कि रामरो पार गति उन्नति रामरी भागो सब लाए सनब्रिज सोलर नेपाल रिप्रेजेंट्स अ ब्रिज बिटवीन नेपाल Sunbreeze works closely with local partner organizations for effective implementation to help communities become self-reliant and for Nepal to achieve the sustainable development goals. listening and uh, watching our presentation today and we welcome um, any feedback and please contact us if you would like to explore any of these ideas or collaborate.